أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We've reached ayah number 69 of Surah At-Tawbah and the theme that has emerged in the verses that we've covered is essentially the theme of hypocrisy within the Muslim community and there are many verses in the Holy Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings this issue, brings attention to this issue, and raises this issue with the Holy Prophet. And you see that the problem of hypocrisy seems to become, seems to be an increasingly troubling issue in the Muslim community. Now, there were munafiqeen even in Mecca. But as Islam is growing and becoming a formidable force, as the kuffar see that there are benefits and advantages in joining this movement, you know, as, as, as they say, you know, ride the bandwagon or ride the wave, the population of the munafiqeen in Muslim society begins to grow rapidly. And they're starting to create a lot of internal strife. Uh, Sheikh, just and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we did the ayah 67 last time, not 69. Or that's where we ended. We ended. We did 67. 67? Yeah. Yeah, so, the, oh, so this is the yeah, So I'm covering ayah number 68. Yes. Right. Yeah, 60, yeah I, I made a mistake. So this is ayah number 68. So yeah, so I got the numbers wrong. So, so the, the verse that I recited uh, is uh, is uh, 68 from Surah the Tawbah. Perfect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 68, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ وَالْكُفَّارَ نَارَ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا هِيَ حَسْبُهُمْ وَلَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُقِيمٌ Verily God has promised the hypocrites, men and women, and the disbelievers, the fire of hell to abide therein, it shall suffice them, God curses them, and theirs shall be a lasting punishment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous verses gave different descriptions of the munafiqeen. And naturally the question that arises is that they're manipulating the Muslims, they're creating all of these problems what is their punishment? Because they don't seem to be, they seem to evade punishment in this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly says in ayah number 16 what the punishment is for them. That he promises the hypocrites, men and women, so meaning that this is not a gender specific problem. There were hypocrites among the companions who were both men and women. God promises the hypocrites, men and women, and the disbelievers. So you see that in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens, he, meant, he threatens the munafiqeen before he even threatens the kuffar. Now why is that? One possible reason is that the munafiqeen serve, pose a greater danger to the Muslims than the disbelievers themselves. Because the kafir is easily identifiable. The kafir is a, primarily a, a danger to himself, meaning that he has chosen the path of misguidance. Whereas the munafiq, the munafiq has influence in the Islamic society because he's perceived, he's believed to be a Muslim. So because the munafiq, because the hypocrite is misguided and has the potential to misguide others, the punishment is even more severe. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a much more threatening tone when he addresses the munafiqeen. Now, there's a hadith from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, where he says, he speaks about the reality of nifaq, the reality of hypocrisy. And he says, and this is something that we can all, we're all susceptible to, you know, hypocrisy is of various levels, but the, 
the one thing that all hypocrites have in common is the following. Rasulullah says, Man khalafat sariratuhu ala niyata fahuwa munafiq kainan man kan. The Holy Prophet he says, the one whose inner reality differs from his external conduct is a hypocrite. And as I mentioned, this can be displayed, you know, in various ways. Now, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a threat to the believer, to the uh, the hypocrites. What does he threaten them with? fiha. The punishment, the threat is severe. Allah threatens them with hellfire, with the fire of hell for all eternity. Now, as a reader, as a student of the Quran, you may think to yourself that that is a very, very unreasonable punishment. That's an extreme punishment for the crime. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hiya hasbuhum. Hiya hasbuhum means that it is it is a suitable punishment for them. So before you can, before you even ask the question, you know why is the punishment so severe? Isn't that an extreme punishment? Allah says no, it's a suitable punishment. Meaning, the punishment fits the crime. The reason why you think that it's a harsh punishment is because you don't understand the reality of the crime. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes mention of the eternal punishment in the hellfire. And then, you know, because Jahannam has physical punishment and also psychological punishment. So in the same way that paradise offers pleasures to the body and the soul, Jahannam also is a place where the body and the soul is punished. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sheds light on the psychological chastisement of the hellfire. When he says, Allah." So when, when Allah says, for the hypocrites, men and women, and for the disbelievers, there is the fire of hell. The fire is a reference to the physical torment. But, but Jahannam is not just a place of physical torment. You know, someone might be suffering physically, but it's possible for them to be at peace. You know, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, for example, on the day of Ashura, he was physically suffering, but his soul was at peace. In Jahannam, the body and the soul suffer. And this is why Allah says, for the munafiqeen, men and women, and for the kuffar, for them is nara jahannam, the hellfire for all of eternity. And it's a suitable punishment for them. The punishment fits the crime. And God curses them. Now, the curse of God, the la'na of God, you know, when we... Do la'na. La'na is a dua where we ask Allah to remove his mercy from a certain individual or a certain community. Allah, the curse of God, refers to their being distanced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not only are they going to be physically punished, what is even more severe than that is that they are cursed by God. They are recipients of this divine la'na, meaning that they are distanced from his special loving attention and mercy. And this is what Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam alludes to in Dua Kumail, the dua that we recite you know, every Thursday night, where the Imam alayhi salam at the beginning of the dua, he says, Fahabni ya ilahi wa sayyidi. وَمَوْلَايَ وَرَبِّي صَبَرْتُ عَلَىٰ عَذَابِكَ The Imam alayhi salam, he's speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's saying that if it's, essentially the Imam is saying that 
I can tolerate the the adab of Jahannam, the physical torment. But there's one thing that is intolerable, and that is what fakayfa asbiru ala firaqik. How can I tolerate being separate separated from you? If I can endure the flames of Jahannam, if I can endure the physical chastisement, there is one thing that no one can endure, and that is what? Being, having Allah turn away from you. And this is the true punishment. This is the most painful punishment in Jahannam. The firaq, the, to be separated from this special divine grace. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 69, He says, كَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْكُمْ قُوَّةً وَأَكْثَرَ أَمْوَالًا وَأَوْلَادًا فَاسْتَمْتَعُوا بِخَلَاقِهِمْ فَاسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِخَلَاقِكُمْ كَمَا اسْتَمْتَعَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ بِخِلَاقِهِمْ وَخُضْتُمْ كَالَّذِي خَاضُوا أُولَئِكَ حبط حَبَطَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Remember those who were before you. They were mightier than you in power and greater in wealth and children. So they enjoyed their share and you enjoyed your share just as those before you enjoyed their share and you have engaged in vain talk and they and as they engaged in vain talk it is they whose deeds come to nothing in this world and verily they are among the losers now it's interesting that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens them there is an attempt by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to awaken their conscience. And this is really the, the epitome of divine mercy. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being the most merciful and the compassionate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, He desires that the munafiqeen repent. So what does He do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them that, you know, you think that you're manipulating the Prophet, you think that you're outsmarting him, you think that you're powerful, that you're mighty. There were those before you who had more power than you. You know, because the ultimate plan of the Kuffar is what to do what? To wage an internal war on the Prophet. To stagnate his movement. To destroy his, his work from within. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling these munafiqeen in Arabia that there were people before you who tried to do that with previous prophets. And they were more powerful than you. Was, was Namrud not more powerful? Was Fir'aun not more powerful than you? And they failed to destroy the legacy of Musa. They failed to destroy the legacy of of Ibrahim. كَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْكُمْ قُوَّةً وَأَكْثَرَ أَمْوَالًا وَأُولَادًا Those who came before you were mightier than you in power and greater in wealth and children. They had more military might. They had more wealth at their disposal than the, uh, the Quraysh. They had more children, meaning they also had more human capital. They had more foot soldiers than you. So they enjoyed their share. Fir'aun enjoyed his dunya, and then his life came to an end. Numrud also enjoyed his dunya, but it also came to an end. And you engaged in vain talk, and they engaged in vain talk. But Allah says, their actions came to nothing, meaning all of their planning, all of their plotting failed. 
It failed, and it was evident in dunya that they failed. Look at, for example, how much Fir'aun struggled and toiled and how much effort he put to destroy the legacy of Musa alayhi salam. Fir'aun was much more powerful. He exerted so much effort and he failed. Everything that he did backfired against him. And the same thing goes with Nimrud and all of these other tyrants. Their deeds did not come to fruition. They did not achieve their goals in dunya and in the akhirah because they have no connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when they will see the full extent of their failures. Now it's interesting. Who is Allah addressing in ayah number 69? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing who? Kuffar or the munafiqeen? Because the verses are speaking about those who are standing alongside the Prophet, pretending to be his companions and his followers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that you think that you're intelligent, you think that you are conniving, you think that you're going to destroy this religious movement from within. There are those who tried many different tactics before you. And you find, and we'll come to this in the next ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually gives examples of previous nations. There's a hadith, I believe I might have shared it with you guys. And the hadith is mentioned in, in prominent Sunni references, hadith references, where the Prophet he says to his companions, the Prophet says that you shall follow the practices of the, the religious communities before you exactly, step by step meaning that you will replicate the practices of those who came before you shibran bi shibr wa dhira'an bi even to the extent that if the past nations were to have gone into a lizard hole you were going to do the exact same thing now this is of course figurative meaning that the muslim community the Ummah of Rasulullah will engage in the same iniquities as the previous religious communities. What, 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 the, what Bani Israel did to its own prophets, the Muslims will do to their divinely chosen guides. Now question, what did Bani Israel do to the prophets that were sent to them? The answer is very simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, number one, He tells us that many of the, the rabbis, many of the religious folk in the Jewish community, they distorted the Torah, they distorted the religious tradition of Musa. They, they distort religious scripture. If the Quran tells us that religious communities of the past adulterated their religious teachings based on the hadith that I shared with you where the Prophet tells his companions that you are going to do exactly what those before you did. The answer is what? That the Prophet is prophesizing that the Muslim Ummah will also distort his teachings. Number two, Bani Israel, what did they do to their prophets? What did they do to the messengers in the past? They killed them. They kill the messengers unjustly. There are some ahadith 
that say that between sunrise and sunset, Bani Israel would kill 70 prophets. Now the word 70 doesn't necessarily mean literally, but it definitely does mean that between sunrise and sunset in one day, there were occasions where the children of Israel would massacre at least a few prophets. In one day, they would kill a number of prophets. Now if you look at what happened to the Ahlul Bayt, isn't it, can we not accurately say that the Muslims committed the same crimes against the Ahlul Bayt as Bani Israel did against their own prophets? So Bani Israel had this, they would commit the crime of slaughtering prophets. They would murder prophets generation after generation. In the Islamic Ummah, Fatima to Zahra martyred. By who? By those who were, call themselves the companions. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Who was he murdered by? People who claimed to be what? Muslims. Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, all of the Imams, Imam after Imam, is either poisoned or killed by the sword. In two centuries, the Muslim Ummah kills how many Ma'sumin? They kill 13 Ma'sumin. 13 Ma'sumin. So you see, this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of Bani Israel so frequently in the Quran. It's as though Allah Azza wa Jal is telling the Muslims. Do not do to Muhammad and his immaculate family what Bani Israel did to Musa and the prophets that came after him. Or what Bani Israel did to the prophets who came after Yusuf alayhi salam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in ayah number 70, Alam yatihim. نَبَأَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ قَوْمِ نُوحٍ وَعَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ وَقَوْمِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَأَصْحَابِ مَدْيَمَ وَالْمُؤْتَفِكَاتِ أَتَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ فَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَظْلِمَهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ Has not the account come to them of those who were before them? The people of Noah, Ad, and Thamud, and the people of Ibrahim, and the inhabitants of Median, and the overthrown cities. Allah did not wrong them, but rather they wronged themselves. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes when we study history, we study, you know, ancient Babylon, we study the Greeks, we study the Romans. As Muslims, we cannot always attribute the decline of these powerful civil civilizations to, you know, you know, mismanagement of the economy or internal warfare or invasion. We can't look at history through a materialistic lens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now these could have been contributing factors, but we have to understand that there are also spiritual reasons why civilizations collapse and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention to this reality in this ayah, ayah number 70. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that one of the reasons why these people did not prosper, they declined, they were punished, is because of their rebelliousness. Yes, there are empirical reasons why, there are empirical reasons why they 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 collapsed but that's not the only reason don't just say oh these were natural disasters or these are economic failures or this is a result of incompetent leadership yes these are all contributing factors but there are also spiritual factors that have to be taken into consideration so allah is warning these munafiqeen that don't you study history don't didn't don't you see what happened to those who came before you, 
who rebelled against their prophets, who sinned persistently, who turned a blind eye to the truth, who refused to even objectively consider what was being presented by the messengers. And Allah says, أَتَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ that there was no ambiguity, there was no, there was no room for them to have doubts. When Allah sends prophets, He sends them with bayinat, meaning that they gave undeniable evidence, clear proofs. You know, sometimes people today, you know, they might turn away from Islam because they have legitimate doubts. Islam was not clearly explain to them those who taught them islam perhaps didn't have a comprehensive and a clear understanding of islamic teachings but when allah sends ibrahim and nuh and isa and yahya and all of these great individuals they are not only are they wise but they're eloquent they're the best teachers they're effective at conveying the divine message so Allah says, the evidence was very clear, the proofs were clear. So Allah mentions the people of Nuh. The people of Nuh. And again, Allah is speaking to who? He's speaking to the Munafiqeen. One of the things that we learn from Nuh is what? That numbers don't matter. You know, the munafiqeen may think to themselves that, you know, there are many of us. And, you know, Muhammad only has a few sincere followers. Everyone else has joined because of worldly interests. But Nuh, alayhi salam, in the story of Nuh, only 80 achieved salvation. That doesn't matter. Even if the Holy Prophet has only a small number of followers. That numbers don't matter when we're speaking about the truth ad and thamud are mentioned these are very powerful pre-islamic civilizations these are the ancient arabs ad and thamud they were very powerful they were very technologically advanced again allah is reminding the munafiqeen that there are these are examples of Nations that were more powerful and they were destroyed. They failed. They were not able to silence and extinguish the light of Hud and Salih. And then Allah mentions the people of Madian. The people of Madian, who did Allah send to them? Shu'ayb. And they were punished for what? Their unethical business practices. So again, it's almost as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, they cared more about their dunya than their akhirah. They had this greed. And again, when you study Islamic history, you see that this hubbu dunya makes people compromise their religious values. And we see this especially after the death of the Prophet. Wal-mu'tafikat, the overthrown cities, a reference to the community of Lut. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares these specific examples to remind these munafiqeen that there were those who are much more powerful than you in the past who tried to derail the prophets and they failed in dunya and their ultimate failure will be in the akhirah. Ayah number 71, Allah says, so Allah spoke about the munafiqeen. Allah is essentially telling the believers, don't be like these people. You know, when you read the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns you, when he warns you not to imitate certain people or certain communities or certain civilizations, what does Allah usually do after? So he says, don't be like these people. And then he gives us a reference to what we should be like. So don't be like these munafiqeen, be like these individuals, be like these believers, adopt these qualities. Ayah number 71, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ 
بعضهم أولياء بعض يأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر ويقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة ويطيعون الله ورسوله أولئك سيرحمهم الله إن الله عزيز حكيم But the believers, men and women, are protectors of one another, enjoining good and forbidding evil, performing the prayers, giving alms, obeying God and his messenger. They are upon, they are upon whom God will have mercy. Truly, God's, truly God is mighty and wise. Now, this verse mirrors the description of the munafiqeen. If you go back to the verse that we mentioned in our last session, ayah number 67, if you go to ayah number 67, Allah mentions the qualities of the hypocrites. And you find that the mu'mineen, their qualities are the exact opposite of the qualities that Allah listed for the munafiqeen. So for example, وَالْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ مِنْ بَعْضِ The first thing that you should observe is that when Allah speaks about the hypocrites, what does He say? The hypocrites, men and women, are one and the same, meaning they are alike. But when Allah speaks about the mu'mineen, what does He say? وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضِ Allah mentions this issue of wilaya, that believers are supporters of one another. They are protectors of one another. Munafiqun, they don't, they don't really care about each other. It just so happens that their interests have aligned. So the munafiqun, the hypocrites, they may seem to be united. As the Quran says in Surah Al-Hashr, تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى Allah says that they look united, they appear united, but their hearts are disunited. The only reason they're together is because their interests are one and the same at this specific time. But the moment their interests change, you will see that they will betray each other. And this is precisely what you see, for example, among the Umayyads, the Abbasids. The moment their interests diverge, they kill each other. They overthrow each other. They betray each other. So Allah makes no mention of being awliya when he speaks about munafiqeen. There's no true loyalty among them. But when Allah speaks about the believers, He says they are supporters of one another. They are protectors of one another. Even if I have no vested interest with a believer, I'm still going to support him and protect him because of his iman. Even if there is no worldly benefit. This is the, the beauty of the relationship of mu'mineen. So when Allah describes the munafiqeen, what does He say? يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمُنْكَرِ They encourage others to do evil. Now, you know, so it's, it's, it's not, so not only are they misguided, they try to recruit others to join them, to also commit evil. Why? Because they want to get lost in the crowd. Now think about it like this. If I'm a munafiq, and I don't want to go and join the Prophet in the Battle of Tabuk. If I'm the only Munafiq and I stay silent, I'm going to be exposed. So what do I do? I try to get more people to join me. So I'm not singled out. So I, I try to recruit people so I'm not exposed, so I can hide among the other faces. يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمُنْكَرِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلِ الْمَعْرُوفِ They forbid that which is good. Whereas the, the believers are what? يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلِ الْمُنْكَرِ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He say? He speaks about 
المنافقين ويقبضون أيديهم they don't pay charity they're stingy whereas the mu'mineen what do they do zakat. they give they're generous when Allah speaks about the munafiqun what does he say they forgot God and consequently Allah also forgot them the believers what do they do prayer is the way that we remember God Whereas the munafiq, the munafiq abandons the prayer, right? There is no true connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's interesting about this verse, brothers and sisters, one of the interesting elements of this verse is that this verse is significant with regard to the spiritual and social standing of women. You know, brothers and sisters, when Allah says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ Allah then speaks about not only spiritual obligations, but social responsibilities. Meaning women also have social responsibilities. Enjoining good and forbidding evil is a social responsibility. Which means that the role of a woman is not just confined to what happens in the home. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, believing men and women, they enjoin that which is good. They forbid that which is evil. So both men and women, they have these spiritual and social obligations. And, and if you look at... Uh, Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 33, Ayah number 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes into elaborate detail where he speaks about, you know, different virtues that are, that are displayed by both men and women. There is not a single virtue that, uh, that men are more inclined to have than women. Patience, piety, you know, modesty, all of these Qualities can be manifested in both men and women. There's no spiritual disadvantage because of your gender. And then Allah in ayah number 72. So Allah, so, so look at the, the flow of the verses. Allah described the munafiqeen. And then he threatens them with punishment. Allah then describes the believers. And then he speaks about the reward. That, is, that he has prepared for them. Now, I want you to look at this verse from the context, through the, the lens, through the context of Tabuk. So if you recall, the Prophet ﷺ is inviting his, the believers to join him in Tabuk. Many of them, you know, so they live in Medina, you know, a very rich agricultural area in Arabia, they have their farms, their orchards, their homes, and they're going towards Tabuk, which is a desolate land, a desert, where there's limited water. They're leaving their homes behind. They're leaving their gardens and, you know, all of the things that, that are comfortable for them. Look at what Allah says. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ God has promised the believing men and the believing women. So even the believing women are rewarded for their sacrifice because their husbands have to leave. And they have to be able to look after the household and run the affairs of the household in the absence of their husbands who are at war. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it a point to mention that both of them have a separate type of jihad. And Allah will reward both of them in the same way. So imagine there is a companion of the Prophet who joins the Prophet and goes to Tabuk. And this companion, of course, the women are not going to go fight in the battlefields. They stay behind. You know, they look after the children. They look after the household. They look after the affairs of the household in the absence of the husband. 
the reward for both of them is equal. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَمَسَاكِنَ طَيِّبَةً فِي جَنَّاتِ عَدْنٍ وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ Allah says, God has promised the believing men and the believing women gardens with rivers running below to live eternally and goodly dwellings in the gardens of Eden but contentment from God is greater. That is the great triumph. So these believers, you know, they're leaving behind, you know, their, their, you know, their gardens and their streams. Allah says, for you in the hereafter, I'll provide you with gardens and streams. They're leaving behind their homes when they join the Prophet in Tabuk. Allah says, I will give you the best of homes in Jannah. But above all of that, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first speaks about the material blessings of paradise. And after speaking about the gardens and the rivers and the, the pleasant dwellings, what does he say? وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ but the contentment, the pleasure of God is greater than all of that. There's a hadith that I'd like to share with you. And it's a hadith where it's a hadith Qudsi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the people of paradise. So when when all of the mu'mineen enter Jannah and they're given their palaces and you know, they're given all of the blessings that they were promised. They have their spouses. They have the best of food. They're wearing the best of clothes. In the, hadith, the hadith says, Inna Allah will say to the people of paradise, Ya Ahl al-Jannah, O oh, the residents of paradise. فَيَقُولُونَ لَبَّيْكَ رَبَّنَا وَسَعْدَيْكَ وَالْخَيْرُ فِي يَدَيْكَ so when Allah calls upon them, they will say labbaik, meaning here we are at your service. Allah will ask them, Hal radhitu? Allah will ask the mu'mineen, are you pleased? Are you happy? Fayakuluna wa ma lana la narva ya rab. Waqad a'taytana ma lam tu'ati ahadan min khalq. They say, oh Allah, how could we not be pleased when you have given us something that you have not given to any of your other creations? Allah didn't even give this reward to me. Allah didn't give this to malaika or the animals. Or Allah has given these. You have not given a reward like this to any of your creation. How could we not be pleased? And then what does Allah say to Ahlul Jannah? Allah says, do you want me to give you something that's even better than what I have already given you? They're already in Jannah. They have their palaces, their, the jewelry, the food, everything that you can possibly imagine. Allah says, do you want me to give you something else that's even better than all of this? So they ask, Ya Rab, wa ayyu shayin afdalu min thalik. What could be greater than what you have already given us? Fayaqulu ta'ala, Allah will say, Ahillu alaykum ridwani, fala askhatu alaykum ba'dahu abada. Allah will say to them that I am pleased with you. I give you my pleasure. When Allah, the hadith says, when Allah says to Ahlul Jannah, Ya ibadi laqad raditu ankum. When Allah says to the inhabitants of paradise that I am pleased with you, the hadith says they will experience a pleasure and a joy that is incomparable to all of the other delights of paradise. And this is what Allah means when He says, 
that the pleasure of God is greater than all of that. And this is something that has to be experienced. We don't even know what this means. That the fact that Allah is pleased with you, that surpasses all of the bounties and the blessings of paradise. Now, the... The question that scholars have asked is that Allah has promised to give these believers who have made these great sacrifices gardens beneath which rivers flow eternally. They are given a very specific place in Jannah called the garden the gardens of Eden. What is the meaning of the gardens of Eden? So according to a hadith, this is a special place within Jannah. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet And by the way, the, the word Adn in the Arabic language mean, it means Al-Iqama wal baqa that which is enduring and everlasting. You know, that's why when we address, you know, something that's always there. And that's why when we address the family of the Prophet, we say, As-salamu alaykum, uh, ya ma'din al-wahi. Adin, so ma'din comes from the word adin. And we, we address the family of the Prophet because revelation is always descending in their household. So when something is always there and it's there eternally, it's called adin. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he, he explains the meaning of Adn. He says, Adn Darullah. Eden, or Adn as we say in Arabic, is the house of God, meaning it's a place that is characterized by this close proximity to Allah. In the same way that we call the Kaaba Baytullah, this place is in paradise is a very it's a vip location in paradise a place that enjoys this unique proximity to allah it's a place in jannah that no eye has ever seen and no mind can even comprehend so there are people even in jannah who have seen things that are astonishing. Even some people in paradise will not be able to see that area of paradise. And no one will live there. Only three individuals, only three groups of people will reside in the gardens of Eden, according to the hadith. And Nabiin, the prophets, Siddiqeen, the truthful ones, Siddiqeen, again, this is a reference to Mahsumin. And the third is Washuhada, the martyrs. The, the martyrs, these are the three classes of people who will reside in Jannat al Adn, the gardens of Eden. I think we'll uh, we'll stop here for today, verses 73 onward require a bit more detail wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin if there are any questions or comments uh, so the question is about understanding um, what is meant by the pleasure of allah and withdrawing the mercy of allah uh, can you hear me clearly so, so what is meant by the pleasure of Allah and, and what? And the withdrawing of Allah's mercy uh, for the people who are in hell. Uh, so so you're referring to the part of the ayah where, so you're referring to ayah number 69 where Allah speaks about one of the punishments of the, the munafiqeen and the kuffar where Allah says, وَلَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهِ that he distances the, uh, his mercy from them right, right i'm hoping you might be able to elaborate a little bit more on what those things meant now 
when we when the ayah says Allah, that God curses them, as I mentioned, la'na is basically God distancing himself from uh, from the kuffar or the munafiqeen. Now, of course, we're not talking about you know uh, spatial distance because Allah is with, He's closer to uh, to the created beings, even closer than they are to Himself. So when Allah says He distances Himself from them, meaning that He deprives them of His special mercy, and I I use the word special mercy intentionally because. Even the people in Jahannam still, at some level, enjoy Allah's mercy. There is no such thing as a creation that is totally devoid of Allah's rahmah. It's impossible. Because anything that exists by virtue of its existence enjoys a certain degree of Allah's rahmah. That's why in Dua Kumail, the Dua begins by saying what? Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasi'at kulla shay. Allah's rahmah, specifically his rahmaniyya. When we say Bismillah, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, that first name of God, ar-Rahman, is that all-encompassing mercy. Even Iblis, even Fir'aun, those who are in the depths of the hellfire, they are always going to experience Allah's Rahmaniyyah because they exist. And existence is one of the manifestations of Allah's Rahmah. But relative to paradise and, and, and the bounties of paradise, that is... The most extreme punishment. So, for example, if, if someone, you know, someone who's living in a palace and has all of their needs met, if you see someone, you know, sitting under the sun with cloud, drinking a cup of cloudy water, from your vantage point, that person is is in misery. But that person who's sitting under the sun and is drinking that cloudy water is still enjoying some degree of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy by virtue of, of his existence. So it's it's all relative. So even in Jahannam, Jahannam should never be interpreted as a place where there is zero rahmah. It's a place of punishment, of divine wrath. There is no doubt about that. But to say that Jahannam is a place where there is absolutely no rahmah, there's, if Allah removed his entire rahmah, the people in Jahannam wouldn't exist. They wouldn't exist. Now, it's very difficult for us to conceptualize these things because we're talking about a world that is governed by totally different laws than that than the that govern this this earthly life but when allah says he has distanced himself from them they still enjoy some degree of divine mercy did i did i answer the question or did i not understand your question oh uh, well i think um the you kind of summarize the challenge at the end really well that uh it's it's a very different world so it makes it very hard to understand exactly what is going to be experienced at that time and and, and one thing that I, that I would say is that you know people often ask you know why doesn't allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just destroy them why is it that they they have to exist eternally and suffer eternally you know, for some people, they have they have difficulty reconciling that with uh, with His mercy. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is wise. You know, you you and I don't get to decide whether we exist or not. In the same way, your shoe didn't decide to be on your foot. Did your shoe decide to? Did your did your uh, foot uh, your shoe decide to be on your foot? It didn't. Why is it on your foot? Because that's what it means to be the owner. 
you do as you please. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does as he pleases and everything that he does has wisdom. So there is wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep, keeping kuffar and munafiqeen in Jahannam eternally. There has to be some hikmah behind it. You know, you may you may think that it's it's better to just annihilate them, let punish them for a million years, and then exterminate them so they don't exist anymore. But Allah says, "Khalidina fiha." They're there eternally. So we don't we don't get to decide. You know, you know, because people even ask. I was having a conversation earlier this week. And someone asked that Sheikh, you know, life is miserable. I never, Allah never asked me, asked to create me. I never chose. I, I didn't choose to be born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forced me into this life. Yes, Allah forced you. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. In the same way, your shirt and your shoes don't have choices because that, that's the meaning of being an owner. Allah, Allah is the owner. He owns every particle in the universe. You don't get to, he doesn't have to ask you. you, he owns you. But he's merciful, he's kind, he has given you the opportunity to earn eternal life just if you pass a very short exam. And he's given you so many, so many, he has made the exam easy for you if you follow his guidance. And even if you make mistakes, he'll forgive you. You know, it's kind of like a, a teacher that says that I'll, I'll give you this incredible reward if you pass this exam. And during the exam, I can help you. And even if you make mistakes on the exam, apologize and I'll, I'll correct the, the mistakes. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has really given us a, uh, a great opportunity to earn eternal life for what? Just to struggle for a few years it's not it's not bad at all it's a very very good deal and uh, on a related note uh, somebody was asking um is the physical punishment in hellfire going to be like when we sleep and dream or do we suffer exactly the way we do in our present body so we believe that that the hereafter whether we're talking about paradise or hellfire, is both a bodily and a, uh, a spiritual experience. See, so you, you know, in your dreams, when you suffer, there's no physical suffering. You know, you, 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 what's happening in your dream is that that's not your actual uh, body in your dream. Obviously, you know, if you get wounded in your in your dream, the wounds don't appear on your on your physical body because you, that, that's a spiritual realm but in jahannam and in paradise you have you have a body and a, and a soul so the so the the blessings the rewards and the punishments in the hereafter are both bodily and uh, uh material and spiritual you know one of the meanings of the ayah of the quran wa idha nufus zuwijat on the day of judgment, Allah says, and when the when the souls are united, what does that mean? The Mufassirin, they say, and when the souls are united with the bodies, there is a reunion. So in dunya, there was the body and the soul. When you die, the body disintegrates. On the day of judgment, there is a reunion between the body and the soul. And this reunion of body and soul on the day of Qiyamah would be meaningless if Jannah and Jahannam were only spiritual experiences. So this is an indication that it's it's also a, uh, a physical and a bodily uh, experience. And uh, when you were talking about the Garden of Eden, uh, was that a different Garden of Eden from the one that's mentioned in the story of uh, Hazrat Adam and Bibi Hawa? So if you look at the Quran, the Quran nowhere refers to the Garden that Adam السلام, was admitted into as the Garden of Eden. That's that's a biblical uh, uh, expression. In the Islamic tradition, the ahadith do not call the Garden 
that that uh, Adam and Eve entered as the Garden of Eden. It was an earthly garden. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدم, آدم, uh, أُسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ Allah doesn't call the garden that Adam and Eve dwelled in uh, the Garden of Eden. It was a garden, and according to the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt and according to the uh, the Mufassirin of the Quran, this was either an earthly garden or it was a garden in another dimension. But it was not the Garden of Eden and it was not that the paradise that the believers will inherit after the Day of Judgment. Otherwise, Allah, Allah and one of the indications is that that paradise, the eternal paradise, the Garden of Eden, no one is ever asked to leave. So the fact that Adam was removed from that garden is an indication that this is not the Garden of Eden because the Garden of Eden is that eternal paradise whereby when, you, when believers enter, they're never asked to leave. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, you're okay. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, just I would like you to throw light on Salatul Ghufran and Salatul Ridwan. On what? Salatul Ghufran and Salatul Ridwan. Salat, Salatul Ghufran and Salatul Ridwan? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. What is that referring to? Um... They accepted the uh, they accepted salat uh, and um, salatul ghufran. That means uh, you know uh, the salat which is done with kusala. So I'm I'm sorry I'm not uh, my my memory is not. Uh, okay. okay. Next time, Shay. Inshallah. Salatul ghufran and salatul ridwan. Is this a a type of prayer or dua you're referring to? No, no. Uh, this is the, uh, the um, Salat al-Wajib, uh, the everyday Salah. Yeah. It is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he's pleased with us. Oh, are, are you are you yeah. talking about uh, the difference between Qabul and, uh, and Saha? Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, this is a very, this is a very good point. Now, and, and this, this relates to really not just salah, but really any all good deeds. You know, sometimes when we, uh, when we perform an action, so let's take the example of uh, a prayer. Sometimes you offer a prayer that's batil, it's void. When your prayer is batil, it's void, that means you have to repeat it. So for example, if I forgot to do wudu and I prayed salat al and then after Salat al I remember that I didn't do wudu. My prayer is what? It's batil, it's void. I have to repeat it. So this is one. Sometimes your prayer can be sahih. It can be legally correct. So for example, if I do wudu and I fulfill the legal requirement, I master the fiqh of the prayer, but I'm not paying attention. My heart and my mind is distracted. That prayer was correct, meaning that I don't have to do qawa. I fulfilled the legal requirement. That, that salah was sahiha. There's no need for qawa. But that prayer was what? It's not maqbul. It's not accepted. Now, when we say that a prayer is not accepted, it doesn't mean that you have to do qawa. What it means is that Allah was not pleased with it. Meaning Allah is not going to punish you for abandoning the prayer because technically you fulfilled the duty. But you didn't fulfill the duty in a way that was pleasing to Allah. So, so I take myself for example. When I stand up for prayer and I, I fulfilled the legal requirement. I bowed, I did my sujood correctly, my qira'ah was correct, I was on wudu, I didn't do anything to nullify the prayer. I prayed my Lord and Asr. When I meet Allah on the Day of Judgment as Azhar, Allah will say, Azhar, you prayed Lord and Asr, but it was sahih, I wasn't pleased with it. I'm not going to throw you, I'm not going to punish you. But I'm not going to reward you for that prayer because I wasn't pleased with it. 
So many times when we offer our prayer, we're just we're just removing, protecting ourselves from punishment. We're not doing it in a way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us. And this is why Allah in the Quran, what does he say? On the on the tongue of of Habib. Innama yataqabbalullahu minal muttaqin. Allah accepts the actions of muttaqin. Muttaqin are who? People, if I, I I'm gonna loosely define muttaqin as those who do their wajibat and avoid the muharramat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with those types of people. You know, I'll give you a very simple example. Imagine at work, you have a boss that gives you a project. And he gives you a very strict deadline. And he says, this project has to be completed on Friday. And you don't do it. You miss the deadline. And on Saturday... You throw this huge party for your boss at your house. Is that party really going to mean a lot to your boss after you didn't submit the project on the on the mentioned deadline? It's not going to be even if you throw the most lavish party, it's really not going to mean that much. But if you meet the deadline on Friday and the next morning or Monday you offer a cup of coffee to your boss, your boss is going to be very pleased. That cup of coffee is would is is going is greater is going to be more appreciated than a lavish party that you throw for him after you miss the deadline. This is why when Imam Al Baqir and Imam Al Sadiq they were in Hajj together, Imam Al Sadiq was young and he was doing tawaf and he was doing all of these mustahab tawafs. Imam al-Baqir saw Imam al-Sadiq sweating and exerting so much effort, he put his hand on the shoulder of his son. And he said to him that, Oh my son, if you do your wajibat and avoid the muharramat, you don't need to do very much more than that to please Allah. Meaning Allah will be pleased with the qalil that you offer if you have taqwa. But if you don't have taqwa, if you're backbiting and you're sinning and you're lying, even if you read dua joshin al-kabir, even if you stay up all night and you do salatul layl, it's not going to have a lot of value. But if but if you do your wajibat and you avoid the muharramat, and and one day one you read one short dua per day, and you don't do anything beyond the wajibat, Allah is going to be very pleased with you. That's going to be maqbul. Because you're worshipping Allah in the way that He wants to be worshipped. Avoid the sin and do your obligation. The problem with you and I is what? We commit sin and we try to compensate by doing what? By doing all of these extra things. It would be better for us to just avoid the sins. That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, اجتنابوا السيئات أولى من اكتساب الحسنات. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam he says, refraining from sin is better than doing good deeds. It's better than doing those extra good deeds. So that that's that's the meaning of uh, of qabul. And we have to really ask ourselves when I offer my prayer, is it just correct? from a legal perspective, or is it accepted by God? Meaning that Allah was pleased with it. Is that, I hope that's clear. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you very much. All right. yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Sheikh. Inshallah, we'll, we'll meet again next week. Inshallah, looking forward to it. This is the amazing sessions, and we we're very fortunate to be able to have you. No, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm I'm fortunate to have you because uh, it uh, it compels me to uh, to stay up to date with uh, the the So I I owe you guys a debt of gratitude. <laughs>